uh, as Duncan said, I'm Richard Sherman. I'm a professional photographer and a proud member of the American Schooner Association. Um, I've photographed the Great Chesapeake Bay Schooner Race uh, several times and looking forward to, uh, to this year's event, Duncan. So thanks for inviting me uh, today. Um, so we'll spend, I don't know, uh, about 40 minutes or so, maybe 45 minutes, and then we'll take some questions. We did a, a seminar like this, Duncan, what was it, maybe four or five years ago yeah. uh, when we had our annual meeting up in Mystic, which is the first weekend in February each year, um, COVID <laughs> being a different time. But um, we did this and we thought maybe a good time to dust off the cobwebs, put a new coat of varnish on and get ready for the sailing season. And um and uh, including the Great Chesapeake Bay Schooner Race coming up in at the end of the uh, season in That's October. Second week of October, everybody hold on. <laughs> uh, so great. So let's let's talk about photographing sailboats. Um, we've got, uh, like I said, about 40 minutes of chatting. I'll try to keep an eye on the questions in the chat, but I probably will take them at the end. Um, so uh, why don't we just uh, jump into it and let's get started. This looks should look familiar to you. Um, perhaps you remember it from those nervous days of high school algebra. Um, but we're going to use this as a construct, a paradigm uh, to talk about um, making good images better and how to take sailing photographs, talking about the three dimensions um, that we're working with as photograph as as sailing photographers that we want to work with. So there are some considerations. It is a difficult environment, right? I do a lot of landscape work. I do nautical images of binnacles and ropes. When I make an error, really, that's on me. But it's very demanding uh, when we're on, on the bay or at sea uh, for, for a lot of reasons. Um, first off, just starting with the photography, one of the challenges of photography is that it's a two-dimensional medium. And we see and live in three call it four dimensions. <clears throat> and so how we see, we think oftentimes implicitly that the camera will see, but the camera is a tool and it works very differently. And using this construct, this three dimensions, we'll talk about some tips on how to convert what we see into good and hopefully great images. Um, so with photography, it's an artifact. We're working in two dimensions. Um, we have height, we have width, we don't have depth, we don't have time, time is frozen. Um, and so it's very different than the world that we live in. Photography also lives in a rectangle. Uh, we don't look through and take pictures in circular formats or triangular formats, um, but we're living in a rectangle and that rectangle is static. It's every time we lift our phone or every time we lift our camera. And so that provides certain challenges for us um, as well uh, as the dimensionality issue that I mentioned just a moment ago. There's a quote I, I say all the time. It, it's this really simplicity of the camera and photography that makes it so challenges, challenging. Moving from four dimensions or three dimensions into two dimensions, that conversion process takes effort and makes things even more challenging uh, than we really appreciate and realize oftentimes when we're out shooting. <clears throat> You, you, I, if you do sailing photography or any type of photography, you've probably heard maybe dozens of times now, we have to learn to see. It, the challenge is that no one seems to complete that sentence and that is learn to see how the camera sees. We're not gonna talk about shadows tonight and um, uh, EV or exposure values, but our eyes see very well into, sh into shadows. Um, whereas cameras don't see as well and blacks turn very black when we have silhouettes. And so we have to understand how the camera sees in order to effectively construct images, in order to convey messages using photo photography as our language. So without further ado, we'll jump into the, the horizontal axis and we'll talk a little bit about um, placing objects. So in, in fixing the horizontal, one of the things that really is difficult for your viewer and for anyone is to look at an image with a crooked horizon line. Very challenging to get a straight horizon line in sailing nautical photography. Um, but we have to get that horizon line straight um, otherwise, we provide visual dissonance. We provide visual noise, like a bell uh, ringing in the background when we're trying to have a conversation. It starts to become annoying to us. And so crooked horizon lines generally drive 
us crazy. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, and so always, always, always have a straight horizon line. You can fix this in post-production. It's easy enough. Always have a, a straight horizon line. And when I say always, I mean usually. That's what I'm really trying to say. I'm not, I don't really mean always. If you want to add drama, you can have a little bit of a crooked camera, but then we have to be really zoomed in and, and not have a large horizon line. So always means sometimes, but if you're going to have a significant amount of horizon in your image, um, and I'll show you some examples in a moment, uh, you, you need to have that horizon line straight. Otherwise, it looks uh, wacky. And once you see it, like I said, you can't unsee it and it becomes a nuisance in the image. So let's, let's do an example. This is uh, from Antigua a couple of years ago. This is the famous downhill section of the regatta. So these guys were moving very quickly downwind and they had the, the benefit of moving downhill at sea. So yeah, that doesn't really work so well. We don't have downhill at the ocean. Uh, it just gets much, much better. You cannot not see this now. This is just doesn't make sense to us. It's visually dissonant to us as viewers of the image. This is just a much, much better image. After you get downhill, you got to make the turn and come back uphill in the regatta, right? So your close haul going uphill, this is a longer portion of the race. And so we have these boats now going up the hill, which doesn't exist. Fix the horizon line. It just looks so much better. Once you see it, you can't not see it. So get the horizon line straight, except if we're kind of zoomed in and working on action. If it's an action shot where we're having, in this case, uh, a, the, the gentleman cranking on the winch handle and the water flowing over aft of, on the aft portion of the boat, um, then we can get in. This is clearly an uneven horizon line, but I, I think we can forgive you as a photographer uh, because you've given us so much in the foreground that we can get away with it. This is a, a Danish Navy yaw which I got to be aboard for a brief period of time and they even let me sail it as a temporary officer of the Danish Navy. Worst days were never had for the Danes. <laughs> Fear struck in the, in the hearts of all of Denmark. But um, they were at the St. Thomas International Regatta for to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the sale of the Virgin Islands to the United States. And so they have this beautiful yawl uh, that was competing in the St. Thomas International Regatta. I th the, the, the deck is, is tilted nicely. I think we get away with that crooked horizon line here. As you can see, it's a very, very small section here. Um, so we can get away with it, but it's not a significant portion of the image. So we add drama. I didn't purposely turn it. It was just bouncing around on the boat that I was. But I think I can get away with it here uh, since there's so much of value and so little of the horizon line. We talk about the horizontal axis as well. We now have to consider the objects of visual interest and where we place them on the continuum from left to right. Um, this is a decision, right? It's a lot of times we're so anxious to take the photograph, we lift the phone or the camera and we start clicking away. Um, your images will get better and more meaningful um, if we slow down and think about where we put the subject or where we put the various objects of interest within that horizontal axis. Um, and I'll show you some examples in, throughout today's uh, discussion uh, about how this really, really does matter. But it's a decision. It shouldn't be done um, just point and shoot and click. We need to decide where to put these objects of visual in interest. Generally speaking, if a boat is moving into the image, we leave more room in front of the sailboat than behind it. The same is said for wildlife, birds, lions, elephants, what, what, whatever you might have. There's an implicit uh, expectation of that object, whether it be a sailboat or an animal, to move in that certain direction. And so therefore it's a, it, it jives with our um, expectations of what's about to happen. And that makes for a, a more pleasing image. So let's do an example. Uh, I think this is Castine, Maine, I think. Um, but here we see the sailboat moving into the frame. It has room in front of it. Um, and it works pretty well, as opposed to if I was to have this on the right side, it'd be moving out of the frame. Um, why? Why do we have all the room behind it? it? It becomes a little bit confusing. So here we've left room in front of it because we expect the boat to continue in this direction. And it's just visually pleasing to us to do that.
Now, if you have more than one boat, that's easy because I just had one beautiful sailboat uh, moving through the frame. If you have more than one object of visual interest, more than one sailboat, now you have a challenge about how do you balance things? How do you put the different uh, objects of visual interest in different places? And it's very difficult in the marine environment because, well, boats are moving and oftentimes we're moving as well as photographers. And so it becomes very challenging for us. But, but the, the key thing is to decide as best you can where you want that object. Where, and I'll show you the rule of thirds and we'll talk about some other uh, positioning things as we move through this uh, discussion. But it, it should be a conscious decision. I think sometimes we're so excited about the fleeting moment that's at sea that we were, were we could take another half a second, second, two seconds to think about where we want that object of visual interest to be on the continuum from left to right and, and where those other objects should be. And sometimes this means waiting. It, it, does, it actually means slowing down instead of speeding up to get that image in the can, in the, uh, in the uh, camera as quickly as possible. Sometimes it's better to wait so we get boats closer or further or more action or better clouds, whatever it might be. Sometimes the best decision is to not take the photograph and to wait until you, um, you get the objects of visual interest align the way that you'd like them to be. And so this idea of balancing like a teeter-totter doesn't have to be an exact, doesn't have to be symmetric, it doesn't have to be perfect, but two objects are generally better off on two sides of the horizontal axis, generally. There are examples where uh, that's not the case, and I can think of several of them, we can talk about it later, but there are ideas where you're creating tension by having two boats that are close to each other on one side uh, and where it's making, we're trying to make the viewer feel very, very uncomfortable. Maybe there's tremendous drama, uh, an impending collision or the threat of one, but, but, but generally balance provides visually pleasing images. So for example, here is um, Columbia and wild horses a few years ago down in Antigua. Um, so we have the sense of balance here. We have uh, wild horses, which is a much smaller uh, vessel in the foreground. So in the foreground, it's more apparent. It's effectively bigger in our mind than uh, the 43 meter Columbia that's in the background. But also, and I think it goes beyond this class, color, the color of the horses, red is a really powerful color and it can add weight to a smaller object. So a splash of color can help provide balance when you have two objects of different sizes on different sides of the teeter-totter or the seesaw. Uh, Egemagen Reach up in Maine. This was a wait. This was an example of waiting, you know, waiting till the boats lined up, waiting till the boat I was on was in position. Um, I have plenty of photos before this that just don't work. I shot them. Um, I know I said, wait, maybe you shoot them, but when you come back <laughs> inside and you look at them on your screen afterwards, uh, if you're shooting multiple images as we do as uh, professionals, um, you throw the other ones away and you, you end up getting the one that we're at all the objects of interest were lined up. So we have good balance left to right. Again, the, the strong um, red colors and bright colors on the right help to balance the diminutive size of the vessels in the, in the background on the right side. Um, again, this was a weight uh, image. Uh, we got great gesture from the bowmen on the, on the three sloops in the center of the image. We have good balance left to right. Um, we've got uh, the ability for our eyes to bounce around the image and look more deeply into the image because we've given the viewer lots of things here to look at. And in this today's world where everything is sugary uh, and disposable, where our, even our news and, and our images on TV are sugary and disposable. Okay, that was Ukraine yesterday. Show me something today. What's happening? What a great compliment it is as a photographer, amateur or professional, when someone wants to look more deeply into your image, whether it's just simply holding up your cell phone and saying, hey, look at the shot I took. And they say, oh, that's great. Hey, hang on a second, let me see that again. Uh, what a great compliment that is. And so here we have an image with lots of things to look at, um, good gesture, but also good balance. So we have a straight horizon line. We're not gonna have that annoying bell ringing in the background. And we've got multiple objects of visual interest nicely balanced across the, across the frame. 
that's probably enough for today on the horizontal. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the vertical now. Um, that's going backwards, so let's go forward. With sailing photography and nautical photography, it usually ends up to a very simple decision, more sky or more water. That's really the decision that we oftentimes have to make. And it really is pretty simple, which is better, which is more dramatic or more visually pleasing or more beautiful. Do we have great clouds in the sky? Do we have um, dramatic waves in the foreground? What is it? And, and we just favor that element and minimize the other element. There's an old saying in photography that if the sky isn't helping you, it's hurting you. So you're on a great day uh, for the great Chesapeake Bay schooner race. We end up zooming in tight as photographers rather than including a lot of the sky. Um, if it's a flat sea and a beautiful sky, we favor the sky over the sea. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a terribly difficult, but it's a decision as opposed to lifting and shooting, uh, lifting our camera or our phone and shooting, we're actually slowing down and trying to decide also on the vertical uh, axis where to place the objects of visual interest. Other major problem that we often see in images is that there's just too much headroom. And this, this doesn't just pertain to sailing photography, um, but also to portraiture, so you can take this home with you. But how many times do we see images where the head of an individual is in the middle of the frame, the ankles are cut off, and the, uh, there's about uh, two inches or about 40% of the frame is just headroom atop, uh, on top of the person. It, it just doesn't really make sense. Stop. Let's, let's stop doing that. Stop. It's, it's visually dissonant. Let's stop doing that. Um, and we'll talk about the rule of thirds a little bit later. But as it relates to sailing photography, you know, if the sky is more dramatic, leave more room above. If the sea is more dramatic, leave uh, more room in the foreground. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, and that horizon line need not be, in fact, oftentimes the worst place to put it is right in the middle. It just becomes too static and it becomes incongruous with the action of photography by placing a static, stable uh, horizon line right in the middle, moving it up and down is a decision and it also complements the action of sailing that we so enjoy and appreciate. So let's do an example. This was shot up in, um, as I mentioned, up in Maine, I think Castine. And this is one of my El Stinkos. This is a horrible image. Um, I'm not even gonna blame it on a moving boat because the sea is pretty flat here. It's just horrible. That goes right into the trash. I keep it for an example. But you know, 50% of this uh, image is useless. It's dead, horrible, gray, uninteresting skies, it's, aside from the fact that there's a, a boat, a piece of a boat in the right-hand corner. So I didn't even edit this, but this was a keeper for the, in the El Stinko category right here. But how much better it gets when we move the horizon line and we make careful decisions about where to place horizon line. Here we had an advantage of having a couple of, of good, uh, good planes, good, uh, the good foreground, we had good background. We had nice skies, uh, we had great light, we had some uh, clouds catching the light. In the foreground, we had some soft waves rolling. Um, I made the decision to move the horizon line a little bit higher, and this was through cropping as well, um, which was added to it. Uh, but you know, I think we have enough of the repetition of the clouds in the sky to understand what that would likely look like above. However, on the surface of the water, we gain additional information. Flat water, probably, I think this was uh, um, in the Gulf of Mexico, flat water. It tells us how close the vessel is. One of these, I think it's the booze cruise, sunset cruise that's out there. But uh, it tells us uh, how close the vessel is to, to, to the land, it tells you a little bit about the photographer and where they are. We have balance as well. We have um, the boat entering from left to right. So we've talked about earlier, leaving room ahead of the boat in anticipation of it sailing in the, that direction. We have some balance with the bright light and the birds on the right-hand side. Um, so it works out fairly well. This was a, a little bit different situation in that we moved the horizon line towards the bottom. It's, it, as opposed to this one, we had good skies and okay seas. Um, here we had, mm, not particularly interesting seas and um, uh, not the best sky you need, but certainly a better sky than, than water here. And so we decided to uh, move the horizon line. I decided to move the horizon line lower. Now, 
hang on a second. You said to leave room in front of the sailboat and clearly there's no room in front of the sailboat. We have balance. We certainly have that. For me, I thought about this a little bit differently just to share my opinion about it is that it's sunset and there's a feeling of heading home. So I, I think by putting, it's okay to put the boat um, leaving the frame as an idea of leaving and heading back to port um, that I felt was consistent with the message that I was trying to convey on a beautiful sunset. So there are rules always, always, always accept. And this is one of those always, always, always accept situations but the horizon line is much lower. And it can get even lower. I mean, I think this is a good example. I think it's about 15% of the way up uh, the horizon line. I got low uh, to shoot it. Um, C is not particularly dramatic. There's not a whole lot of action in this image, quite frankly. Um, but here we have um, the mast goes all the way to the top. Uh, we filled the frame with the boat vertically. Again, we're talking about the vertical axis. And this gets th those kind of clouds get really cool when we flip them over to black and whites as well. But the idea is, is that on the vertical aspect, we move the horizon line lower in favor of including the, the whole mass. There's not a lot of drama. There's not a lot of action within the boat itself. So we didn't need to go in and cut off the mast. Um, so that's a decision that I made in taking this image. That wraps up kind of the, the couple of the key topics on, on the vertical side. And so we talk about fore and aft and, you know, this has got to be the, the most difficult thing in photography because a, a, a camera has height and a camera has width, but it doesn't have depth. Um, and so this has to be the hardest thing to figure out. Uh, and I'll give you the, the quick way of fixing this. Um, a simple image will often have one subject on one plane, a boat in the foreground, just one subject, one plane zoomed all the way in. Um, and these are what I call boat portraits. And this is what we end up seeing a lot of times, for, ex for example, in competitions or uh, online, we see a lot of boat portraits, which are great. They're on covers of magazines. There, there's nothing wrong with it. They're good photos. As we're talking about visual interest uh, throughout this, you know, putting multiple subjects on multiple planes, middle ground, background, foreground, middle ground, multiple boats, we add increasing visual interest such that people may want to spend more time with our photograph. And sophisticated images may have three or more objects uh, across all three planes, foreground, middle ground, and background. And that creates the dimensionality. That creates that fore and aft feeling. You know, in landscape photography, we use parallel lines like railroad tracks or uh, fences that converge. Um, in in uh, sailboat photography and sailing photography, oftentimes we need to place objects on the different um, on the different planes because we don't have the ability to have <laughs> railroad tracks running across the ocean. Um, but multiple objects also bring us on multiple planes, also bring us to this advanced idea in photography of rhythm. And this is the idea defined as how your eyes move around the frame. And so we can create very pleasing images by carefully placing objects left to right, top and bottom, fore and aft, and have uh, the viewer's eye move around the frame in a pleasing way, in a way that provides them some joy and some appreciation. Um, and that's kind of an advanced thing that we can do. We end up with good rhythm if we're carefully using all three of these axes. I would say also many images, and this includes your landscape work as well, if you're uh, uh, if you're on the hard uh, and walking around a bit, would it would benefit from from just adding a, an object in the in the foreground, whether it be a buoy at sea or um, a dinghy on the on the beach uh, with a great sunset in the background. Uh, adding something in the foreground helps to create the forward and aft, fore and aft, the third dimension of depth into our images when we're talking about the nautical or marine environment. So uh, for example, um, I'm just looking at questions. So I, I use planes and, and foreground, middle ground, background um, interchangeably, but I just wanted to make sure you understood what I was talking about. So I just put this slide in here. So here's a classic boat portrait, uh, cat boat 
at low tide in Cape Cod. Great light, very pleasing. It's about the boat. That's all it's about. Maybe a little bit of low tide, but it's about the boat. Here we've added the foreground element to it where we create um, more visual interest, right? It tells us a little bit more. It gives us more to look at. It adds something to the image. Now you may very well prefer this image to this image, but that, that's, that's not the point here. I'm talking about adding um, dimensionality uh, and depth to your images. This is not a deep image. This has dimensionality. This has forward and aft. And then we can create it even more. Right now we have even multiple objects in, in the uh, middle ground. We have some geometry in the foreground that provides interest. We have color in the background. We have some clouds. We have this nice continuum from red or orange all the way up to, to deep blues uh, in the sky. And so what we've done here is add some sophistication to the image. I'm not saying that this image is worse than the other images. I'm just saying they're different images. Um, and these are the images that uses the third dimension of forward and aft, um, foreground and background um, to create depth into the image. Now, I have my phone here. This is a tip I use in, when I teach photography and I'm getting, uh, I'm receiving uh, income from this. So I'm gonna wait uh, and make sure everyone has a chance to Venmo me, especially Duncan, uh, Venmo me or PayPal me some cash before I give out this tip, so. No, okay, it doesn't look like anyone's, anyone's sending any cash today, so you're gonna get it for free today. It's a, it's a holiday week anyway. So for those of you who have tiny boats in your frames or tiny subjects, whatever they may be, family members, um, birds, orchards, whatever, it, it, here's what I tell people, take a shot. I do this all the time with my students. Zoom in 25%, take the shot again, same shot. Then zoom in again, take another uh, shot, 25% uh, uh, closer, 25% more zoom in. Now you stop. This all takes all of maybe 60 seconds. And evaluate your, evaluate your image. Which one is best? Which one do you prefer? This exercise allows you to grow, because I don't know all the people and, and your styles, allows you to grow as a photographer, because we all go back to what our tendency is. And for the people who have tiny boats in their frame, Almost always they pick the second and third option uh, when they do this exercise, whether it's just a boat, the subject uh, is too small. They generally like the second or third option. Generally, the, uh, when you have boat portrait folks, folks who tend to be too far in and you know who you are, um, do the opposite, zoom out, zoom out 25% and zoom out another 25%, stop and evaluate. And, and if you do this a couple of times, it becomes, almost second nature to add a little bit of space around your image after you get done taking your boat portrait. You may just love boat portraits, but you can actually add um, a little bit more visual interest sometimes if you just get in the habit of doing this exercise. I, I, I do it with my, my students all the time. A conversation about composition wouldn't be complete without the rule of thirds. And for many of you, this is familiar, but I need I need to just reinforce it or introduce it to the folks who may not be familiar with you. Um, we use it all the time. It works. It, it's almost never doesn't, it almost never doesn't work. But essentially the rule of thirds, just to recap, you know, you have, if you draw a line a third of the way from the top and a third of the way from the bottom, similarly, a third away from the left, a third away from the right, as you look at through your camera, you end up with this kind of grid pattern and placing the subject at one of these intersection points is often very pleasing, often is, is very helpful when you're taking images. Um, at the top, I don't know, we don't really use a lot of top stuff, maybe if there's someone up the mast or something like that, but bird photography will often use the top of the frame as, as well, the, the top two buttons as opposed to the bottom. So anyway, uh, without further ado, this is some beetle cats up in Nantucket, slide it right in, lo and behold, there it is, it works. The boat's moving into the frame. We have multiple objects. Uh, we have some degree of balance here from left to right. We have the right height. We don't have too much sky, no max headroom. We have the nice uh, uh, lighthouse in the background with good colors. We have complementary colors from left to right between the flag on the lighthouse and the, um, the sail on the beetle cat in the background there. Um, rule of thirds is just very, very effective. When in doubt, use it. It's, it's hard not for it to not work. 
Um, again, our Danish yawl, same type of thing. Now, this is not nearly as sophisticated an image as a just really one subject, but still, we're, the, the subject is moving into the frame. We've left room in front of it. We've, had, we've got the vertical axis pretty well. We don't have a lot of stuff we got the, on the horizontal other than a, a straight horizon line. But the rule of thirds works very, very well and should be a, a, the dominant um, way that you compose images at, for most people and for most situations. Okay. Um, the marine environment, the sailing environment is extraordinarily difficult. Um, you're banging around. We got six, seven foot seas in Antigua on the press boat. You've got two, three foot seas in the bay, whatever it might be. It's just really difficult. Even though you know in your mind where you want something to appear, it's really difficult to get it exactly where you, you need it. So cropping is really the life jacket for sailing photographers. You know, a, a lot of folks of a certain age, I started with film. A lot of folks like to get it right in the can. They get it right in the camera. Uh, you know, I, I got to say, it's it's you're going to miss a lot of photographs if you're just relying on getting it right uh, in the in the frame. Um, photographs of sailing require almost always require some degree of cropping. Maybe it's only five or ten percent, but generally the horizon line is going to be off. You're going to have to straighten it. You're going to have to then crop it because otherwise it gets all wonky. Um, everything's moving. You're moving, the boat's moving, even the very foundation of which your subject and you are resting is moving. So the key here is to shoot in burst mode. Don't shoot in single shot mode. If you have burst mode, shoot in burst mode. Storage is cheap. It's easy enough to delete or not delete, just store it if you want to. But shoot in burst mode. This is action. This is sport photography, right? Uh, the Super Bowl uh, guys aren't shooting with uh, and gals aren't shooting with um, single frames. They're they're shooting uh, 14 frames, 10 frames a second, something like that, and they're getting rid of most of them. This, these things are moving. It's it's just difficult. Um, and then you you straighten and crop these images uh, afterwards. Um, and and a key thing is I know I've missed so many photographs by trying to get in too close. And I've learned over time with sailing is to leave an extra. I'm going to call it 20% ballpark, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, but 20% extra room uh, around your subject. Like you have it perfect here, you zoom out just a hair, the, the, the image looks perfect in your frame, you just zoom out a little bit, uh, a, a little turn. Um, and then when we do have to crop it and do have to straighten it in post-production, Lightroom, Photoshop, whatever application, uh, your iPhone, whatever you use to straighten the horizon, you don't clip things that you really want, or you don't have your subject out of, outside the rule of thirds, if you're trying to use a rule of thirds, leaving an extra 20% around the edges um, and zooming back a little bit, um, pulling back a little bit, saves a lot of images. You know, you can't really, you know, you can tell a model, do that again. You can't tell a sailboat, hang on a second, you know, uh, I missed that one. So leave yourself a little bit of extra room and you'll be pretty happy with it. And then in cropping, you know, you can get rid of elements you don't want. You know, the the piece of that, uh, the stern of that other boat that's in the way, or you can crop them out, or um, someone's head, or whatever it might be, a a, a piece of trash or, or floating in the water. You can either touch it up or move it out. Um, but the post production process and the cropping process is one about making, again, another layer of decisions of how you want that final image to be. You do as best you can when you're out shooting the sailing event, and then you take another pass about making decisions, a second round of decisions, when you're sitting in front of your computer, you're dry, you're warm, and well-fed. Um, and so, you know, with cropping, you can make action shots go from good to great. You know, just look at a sailing world or um, sail magazine or, you know, whatever magazine or, or periodical you're looking at of a sailing race. Well, oftentimes, you know, those are almost all cropped. Of course, I've had a couple of, a couple of covers and, you know, they, they, they crop them a lot, you know, because they want that action uh, to be really paramount, really visible uh, within the image. So cropping is an integral part of the process. Now, one of this, just kind of wrapping up, one of my secret uh, recommendations, not secret anymore, but is to go crop your images two to one. In other words, twice as wide 
as they are tall. And you've seen a number of examples, the Agamogen, uh, uh, with, uh Reach Regatta with the um, spinnakers up, where I've cropped them two for one. Now, many of you are, hopefully, maybe I'm not just Duncan and I, or have an age where we remember the old square-ish uh, tube televisions. Um, but today we're working in a, we're looking at 16.9 television screens. We're looking at wider tele television screens and, and, and many of our screens, I'm looking across two monitors here. Um, my monitors aren't anything but square. Um, so why not participate in that evolution and crop your images so they're a bit wider uh, than they are tall? It's also helpful to get rid of useless uh, sky or water uh, in the image. And it brings us to a couple of examples. Uh, two weeks ago, this is the Ashanti 4, built in Bremen, Germany, a space sail schooner. Uh, in 1954, 34 meters long uh, in pretty good seas. Uh, actually, a lot of the folks were wet when they came in that day. Uh, but here's a two to one crop, right? We got rid of that uninteresting or, or excessive, I guess would be the word for foreground and water. And immediately we feel closer to the action. I, I, it's just very tangible. Similarly here, I know, horizon line's not straight. I know it, right? You, once you see it, you can't not see it. Anyway, I didn't edit this one. Um, I didn't have time to edit this one, but I just put this up as an example. But here again, we got a crooked horizon line. I know it's driving you all crazy now that you see it. Uh, but we also have too much foreground and we got this kind of algae in, in, the, in, the, in the foreground as well. And so we just get closer to the action um, when we get rid of um, boring uh, uh, foreground or boring sky and use a two to one crop. It, it, it's how we view a lot of things today, televisions and a lot of other uh, movies, a lot of things. So naturally we can use this in photography. So I think, how are we doing on time? I think we're doing pretty well. Um, um, okay, so I'm just trying to figure out the time here. So, no, let's do this. Doing great, Rich. Good. good. Okay. Um, so let's wrap up um, with a conclusion here. Uh, horizontal, you know, get the horizon line straight, decide, decide, decide where we want these subjects to be. Sometimes it means, or objects to be. Sometimes it means waiting. Sometimes it means moving. Um, make a decision. It's your, it's your image. And, you know, what's, it, what's interesting, what's pleasing to you, uh, make those decisions. On the vertical, you know, if you have maximum headroom, we have minimal interest. We saw examples of horrible sky, uh, excessive sky room above the image, uh, above the subject. Just it's just weakens an image. It's, so choose what's more interesting. Get rid of what you don't want. That either in the frame, but especially when it gets to the point when you're cropping your images uh, on your on the hard. And forward and aft, that tough third dimension. If you're a boat portrait person, try zooming out. If you're a, a person who has tiny subjects in your frame, try zooming in. Um, it's a great thing to try. I mean, after all, it's free and it takes seconds, right? And you know, let's just say you're, you know, at a regatta in um, off the coast of France. Let's just say, you know, you're probably not going to get back there every year or may, maybe ever again. So um, shoot another picture, shoot another two pictures, zoom in a couple of times or zoom out a couple of times and whatever. And you'll grow as a photographer and you'll find out what's pleasing, most pleasing to you. Uh, so crop baby crop or remember your life jacket. You're only part of the way done after you press the button. Uh, images go from good to great when we're working uh, in, um, in on our computers or on our cell phone screens to crop, adjust color, whatever it might be. Um, that's, that's really an integral part of sailing photography because it is so, so difficult when so many things are moving. So a final example, back to high school geometry, or excuse me, algebra. Um, you know, th this is a, an example. I don't have too much foreground. I've got it pretty good going to the top. Um, maybe you want to see the, the wind direction indicator. I'm okay where it is now, but maybe I could have done a little better there. We've got left to right. Uh, we've got a horizon line. We've got objects of interest lined up very nicely left to right. Um, we've got uh, dimensionality. Certainly one boat's in the foreground. 
uh, and it looks to be in the lead, at least from where we are, that's being chased by other boats. We've got energy, we've got action, we've got um, chaos, um, and uh, uh, we've got an image here that, that I think works fairly well. So I see there is a question in the, um, so far there's one more question in the chat that I haven't, or the question and answer at the bottom, but I will um, stop here and open it up or turn it back to Duncan if you wanna do um, Q and A by raising hands or however you wanna do it. Hey everybody, Rich, that was just great. Thank you so much for that. It's certainly- uh... <laughs> I, I, I stopped sharing. Yeah, Rich is one of the few people who actually has made a living doing what a lot of us would like to do. Well done. You can say that same thing about being a schooner captain. It's all good. Hey, uh, we're going to pop into the questions. If anybody has any questions, please take a moment at the bottom of your screen. You should have a little symbol that says Q&A. Type in the Q&A, and then Rich will take a shot at it, and we'll get going. All right. Rich, okay. looks like we got something here from uh, from Mark, uh, Mark Dworkin, iPhone usage. Do you see that? Uh, uh, let me see here. Um, I don't have, I have Mike Rutstein saying thank you about uh, being recorded. And I see Sherman's question. I don't, that's where I, that's all I've got so far. Is, do you have a tab oh, that's open? Okay, I hear you. Here you go. Okay, here we go. Um, Kent. Right. How strong are lenses, the lens you're using and what zoom levels, telephotos? Um, the go-to lens is a 70 to 200. It's 80, 90% of the time that I'm using it either in a helicopter or on the, uh, on the, the press boat. Um, the, now, if you don't have a dedicated boat to run you around or a, a, a pilot to run you around, you may need a little bit stronger. I have a two to 500 lens. Um, that I use um, as well. Uh, it just depends um, and depends on the situation. But yeah, I even use my, my 24 to 70 because again, we're on a press boat. And when there's the Columbia or when a schooner comes by close to the aft portion of our boat, we got to switch over to um, you know, a, a shorter lens. So I have two camera bodies, but that, that's me. I mean, you, you're, I don't know, may, maybe, uh, Kent, you're doing this uh, as well with multiple cameras. I, I don't know uh, idiosyncratically how you're doing it, but I would say uh, if you put a, a lens in the bag, it's a 70 to 200. Great. Uh, we've got something here from uh, Mark Dworkin. That's, that's your very first one. Says, okay. Great info. Any specific tips on iPhones? Well, yeah, I mean, a, a couple things on iPhones. They're great. Uh, don't as long as you're not printing them too much. The 13, I, I don't have the 13 yet, uh, but uh, many of my photography colleagues have the 13 and love it just for their quick snapshots. Um, you know, I have the grids on mine, uh, the, the rule of thirds, remember we talked about that. I have that when I pull mine up. Uh, why not? It's, it's a free tool and it works. So, um, you know, zoom in with your iPhone. It has plenty of tools at the bottom. I get your horizon line straight. Um, uh, it does that for you. Uh, you can do that. You can adjust the the um, vertical distortion or vertical perspective, or excuse me, horizontal perspective, very easily in your iPhone. You know, uh, they're great. You know, uh, what can I say uh, on iPhone? You know, use a waterproof case if you if you think you're going to get wet. I'm fine with a water resistant situation. Um, someone asked earlier. Hang on, let me see. It was a uh, it was the first question I answered from an anonymous attendee asking about how do you protect your gear. Uh, these, I have them all over the place. So if you can see this, these are Zeiss alcohol wipes, okay? And you just rip them open. I use them on my cell phone all the time to wipe the lens off. I've, oh, I have them in my wallet. I have them in every camera bag. In salt, and you may be in fresh water, it's different, but in salt, you need at least two of these uh, uh, to get this off, right? To get the salt off. The first one just um, moves a cloud around the screen. The second one actually cleans it, but it is a, and you can buy these on Amazon in a box of, I think a hundred that they come in, but it's a Zeiss alcohol wipes um, and slide one in your wallet. And I, that's something that I use a lot because this thing gets, um, gets salty as well. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, there's a question on, it's, I hopefully I'd answered that. Uh, if not, 
you know, just uh, toss it back in there. How do you hang on to the boat and your camera while everything is going on? And the answer is, is you break your ribs. Um, <laughs> uh, it's hard. It's really hard to do. Um, it's hard. It's very hard to do. Uh, that's all I can say to it. If you have a colleague that can hold on to you, I've held out on to other photographers. They've held on to me. Um, you know, Unfortunately, a lot of photographers tend to be very competitive. I'm not that type of person, but if you have somebody hold on to you, one of the keys in shooting nautical photography and uh, selling photography is not to lean up against something, right? So first off, your safety is number one. Um, that's the most important thing, period, right? You're, you gotta come home to your family, your dog, your loved ones, your buddies. That's the first thing. I keep saying that evolutionarily, once we have, grow a third hand, I'm going to be brilliant at <laughs> the things I try to do because I could always use another hand. But the, the key point is, is that don't lean, don't rest your elbows on the side of the boat because your elbows are essentially a living gimbal, which allows you to adjust. If you're on the um, uh, leaning up against the side of the boat, uh, you're going to end up um, moving at, in tandem with the boat. Whereas if you do, if you hold your camera or your phone up and you don't have your elbows resting on the, on the side of the boat, you're able to uh, soften the blow and move around a lot less. But that's, that's a good question. I've had, in fact, I still have a rather large bruise on my leg because um, you get bounced around a lot. So hard, hard to do. Uh, the only thing I can say is safety first, use your arms as a gimbal, don't lean them up against uh, the boat. Um, what are your typical settings, aperture and shutter speeds? Uh, I think I covered the lenses. Pat asked that, uh, what lenses I use, like 70 to 200 is my go-to lens. It's an F2.8. Okay, um, shoot. Uh, you have my screen, but if you looked at the, if you look at some of the uh, side, if you looked at some of the slides that are scrolling, this is a, a really great tip. Um, <laughs> uh, shoot as wide open as possible. Um, so in other words, shoot at f 2.8 or f4, um, and you isolate that subject. I know we just talked about adding subjects, multiple subjects of interest, but if you're shooting a dramatic image of just one boat or one part of a boat, shoot F 2.8 or F 4, however wide open, however narrow depth of field you can have. And the water takes on a glistening foreground feeling and the sky and whatever the, the junk is in the background becomes uninteresting. And the, the boat seems to, um, seems to pop right out of the waves when you do that. That's for a single subject photograph. Of course, if you want depth of field, you're shooting with a 7200. I tend to default to F8 or F11 because uh, I'm stood off for, you know, depth of field changes. The closer you get to a subject with the exact same settings, the shallower the depth of field. Generally, we're, you know, 50, no, more than that. 100 meters away from the other boats when we're shooting them, maybe a little bit more. Um, so F8 or F11 will get you multiple subjects clearly in the same frame. F2.8 or F4 will, will not, but F8 uh, or F11 will, will get you um, multiple. Now, um, how I do this is when I'm in a pitching boat, um, I like to set my camera to shutter priority mode. And I'm sorry if there's folks who are, you know, just shooting iPhone photos, this gets kind of um, garbly gook, but I shoot in shutter priority mode and I like to shoot it around 1250, one, one, 12, one, 1, 1,250th of a second. And then I see what my depth of field is. It should be about F8, F7, one, F9, F11. If I'm on a moving boat, um, a pitching boat, um, I generally try to have one over 1,250th of a second is what I shoot at. And if I don't have the, of course, the computer in your, in your phone, in your uh, camera will calculate the implicit depth of field or f-stop. Um, if I don't get f, at least f7 or f8, I just uh, put up my, um, my ISO to about 400. So when I step on a press boat, I'm at one shutter priority mode, one 1,250th of a second, ISO 400, and I'm pretty much ready to go to get multiple subjects 
in the field. When I, when I want to get something um, shallow, I either jack up my uh, shutter speed if I don't want to switch over to aperture, aperture priority mode to something like one five thousandths of a second or something like that, one six thousandths of a second, something like that. And you get down to about F4 or so. So you got to move kind of quickly sometimes when you're, when you're shooting sports. But uh, I, think, um, I think that answered that. Um, yeah. Uh, and who we'll asked that question? Uh, let's see. Uh, Rich, roll up to the top there. You've okay. got, Paul Carroll's got one at the very top. Just scroll on up on the top of that thing. Okay. Yeah. I got Paul. Uh, would you say two to one? Would you? When you say two to one, would you include 16, nine in that bucket? No, uh, I, yes, I would. I don't mean purely two to one. I like to do two to one. Um, that's how my brain sees things now after so much time. But 16, nine is perfectly, perfectly fine as well. And some, some images I put up are three to one or four to one. Because, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can experiment with it in post-production. Great, great question. Um, and then I get, uh, okay, Mike, uh, he has a Canon digital SLR with me. He's shooting a program on my afternoon with too much depth of field. Yeah. Um, so the quick answer, Mike's saying he gets too much depth of field. Mike, don't shoot in program mode. Program mode lets a computer uh, do everything automatically except for popping the flash. It'll do everything else automatically except for popping the flash. Um, I'm just clarifying. Shoot in uh, aperture priority mode at, at, I don't know what your lowest your widest aperture is f4, f5, 6, f2.8, whatever it might be, shoot, start there. Assuming you're not moving around too much. If you are moving around too much, well, no, f4, f2.8 is going to be fast. So yeah, I would say that. Shoot in aperture priority mode. Um, so you're shooting at f4 or f2.8, whatever is, quote, wide open, whatever is the um, largest aperture of your lens. And you're going to get rid of all the all the nonsense in the background. I think I answered it. All right, good. Not a question, but thanks for the letter. Okay, uh, Doc Lock for time. So I tend to get more boat portraits from the, okay. Well, thanks, Chad. Thanks for joining us. Um, you know, toss your, I, I, in New Jersey, you know, there's some, some a few cat uh, races every year and, um, you know, uh, getting a good position on the dock with a tripod, you can still take some, some pictures. Uh, yep, yeah, I, I shoot drone photography, Cameron. Got a couple of them back here. I, I took a, the little, the little, I just picked this up, the little Otel um, uh, Mini Plus. Yeah, Mini Plus. Took that down. Uh, it's 249 grams. Doesn't have to be registered with the FAA. I don't have to get a uh, registration with FAA. So it's, and it does amazing video. It does some pretty darn good um, images. Not as well as my Phantom 4 Professional um, the Mavic 3, there's guys down in, uh, a guy down in um, Antigua that I flew with in the helicopter. He, next day he went out and took out his Mavic 3. I uh, flew it three miles offshore and three miles back. Yeah, drone. The, so the question is, is any tips for drone photography? Well, a couple of things on drone photography. I, I particularly like shooting on a very steep angle, on a very steep angle when it comes to sailing. You know, you can video at, you know, 100 meters or 70 meters as a boat's going by a height or you know, 70 feet high as a boat, not meters, 70 feet high as a boat's going by. I preferred really steep, personally, very steep angles on, but you just have to remember that we lose the three planes that we talked about, the three dimensions, um, not three dimensions, the three planes, foreground, middle ground, and background don't exist when you shoot straight down. All right. So basically, the hull is against the background. The sails stick up, but it's imperceptible to us because we're right on top on a steep angle. And that's where shadow becomes incredibly important. So if you're shooting drone photography, shoot it late uh, and, this, and try to um, get the sail uh, shadows out on the water. And that is just dynamite really just dynamite. You also, depends on your perspective when you fly around a boat, if you are shooting in the middle of the day or, or at bright sun, um, you, if you get on a certain side, I'm trying to remember, uh, you get on the, with the sun, shooting back into the sun, 
um, you get uh, like a like a crystallized water. The water looks like it's it's all crystal. And so, you know, it, it, when you shoot sailing photography, take a, a, a one turn around the boat and you'll see what I'm talking about if you're shooting in the middle of the day. There's one side of it where you really get, uh, looks like uh, diamonds are in the water. The water turns from blue to kind of white. And that's really kind of cool. Uh, hopefully that answered your question. Just shadows and um, and get on the shoot back into the sun a little bit uh you're not not shooting in the sun because you're shooting straight down but you get that 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 water to light up so that it looks like a diamonds um blur the background with f-stop uh, michael's asking what is my feeling um what is your feeling about trying to blur the background f-stop if your subject is on the boat you're taking a picture from well um what does he or she look like? <laughs> I guess I would ask. If they look like me, you don't want to have a blurry background. You want to take you want to take the interest off of the subject. But on a serious note, um, your subject's on the same boat you are. The, the, you're deciding whether you're taking a portrait of that individual working the the winch, working the the halyards, whatever it might be. Is that what you're shooting or are you shooting that person in the context of a regatta or overall environment? So I would say when you decide that it's about that person, that moment, that action aboard your boat, absolutely shoot F4, F28, even F5, 6, because you're going to be close to that person on the boat anyway. Uh, so even if you're at F5, 6, because as I mentioned before, all the same settings, the closer you are to the person, or the subject, the narrower the depth of field, right? Um, and there's there's depth of field calculators, there's apps that you can buy that, that show you this. But even at F5.6, you're gonna have a blurry background as it relates to things that are off the boat. But the, the closer you can get to F2.8, the shallower the depth of field, if you're right on top of the person, you run the risk of, you know, their, their face is in focus at F2.8, but their hands are out of focus. Um, F4 is pretty safe most of the time. So I'm in a panic. I have a second. There's a wave coming over. Someone's pulling on a halyard. I'm at F4 is my answer. Um, Joyce Kelly, who, who I know very well because she's been related to me as my sister for some years, um, some 50 plus years. But do you do much manual adjustment of your exposure when shooting sailing? Or do you tend to shoot in automatic mode and correct in post-processing? Um, the answer is I tend to, you know, shoot in shutter priority mode or mostly when I'm shooting sailing races um, and I let the camera do the rest. It generally works pretty well. I do spot metering. Um, so where I put my focus is where I put my meter. Um, and I want that to be uh, uh, best focused and the best light on it. I end up almost always having to, like I would say 99% of the time in post-production, I have to reduce the highlights, right? Because even like Duncan's uh, background picture here with the red sails and the white hull, the white hull is gonna have to be, um, the white hull is gonna have to have the highlights reduced a little bit on it. So I would say I shoot in shutter priority mode. I take what I get, cause you know, I'm gonna hop around. If I put, you know, if I make a manual adjustment by the time the next cloud passes through or the next boat that has a blue hull comes through I'm gonna be off again. And I just don't have that kind of time when I'm shooting a sporting event. Um, but I would say expect to, and even in your, your cell phone, if you shot a sailing photograph, the first place to start is a horizon line. The second place I go is reducing the highlights. Um, what are some tips for printing your photos like a professional? Thanks. Uh, okay. Thanks for your kind words also, Christopher, as well. Um, okay. I'll try to keep this. I'll try to keep this short. Um, there's an old saying, you can have good, fast, or cheap. And you can have two of them, but you can't have three of them. So, right, you can have good and fast, but it won't be cheap. You can have cheap and fast, but it won't be good. So you were interesting, Chris, in, you know, good, and you haven't indicated um, whether you want it fast or cheap. I, there, I just had this conversation with a, with a, um, uh, a gentleman here today about this. You know, he was doing a lot of stuff at Costco, a lot of stuff at um, uh, Staples. I don't even know if Staples is is cheap. Uh, it's, it's reasonably fast. I, you know, it's a, I took a, a class years ago with a master printer um, named, named Bob Korn, K-O-R-N, Bob Korn up in New England, 
brilliant guy. And he does work with some of the top photographers in the world for gallery hangings. Really, really smart, smart, uh, talented guy. But he, he got to understand that it's not quite as easy as sending an image to a printer, right? So if you if I pick up my phone and I show you my phone, this substrate is black. And so we RGB, red, green, blue, are the pixels that are added to a black substrate. Unfortunately, when we print something out on a piece of paper, the substrate is white. And that's when we have to convert to CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow. We don't convert the K, K stands for black. That's your set point. That's how they set the printers. The, the better printers, the better organizations, excuse me, uh, the more sophisticated printers are expensive because of the accuracy of colors. Um, there's a couple of companies that I, I use mostly things that are, you have to apply for them and all that stuff. But MPIX, Mike, Peter, India, X-Ray, and they have coupons all the time. MPIX um, is actually behind quite a number of other print shops and they do an excellent job. And I think you can click a box and do color correction. I've used them for family stuff when I don't have time to do the editing and I'll click the color correction box and they'll do the corrections and they turn out fantastic. So I've used M, Mike, Peter, India X-Ray, MPIX um, work does very, very well for pure prints. Uh, I, a, a lot of guys I know, I don't use them. I don't think I've ever used them Bay Photo out in California for creating art like acrylics and canvases um, more than prints. Uh, but I, 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 I've had good experience myself with MPIX, Mike, Peter, India, X-Ray. Um, they do good work there. I'm not sponsored by them. I don't receive anything from them. Uh, you asked me what's a good printing shot, uh, shop. I think that's a good one to start. There's other ones you can investigate. I like to support local businesses. Um, I've done some stuff in New Jersey with a local printer, um, which uh, didn't survive um, didn't survive the, the downturn. But if you find a local printer, ask them. They should give you test prints. You know, nothing like supporting local businesses as well and, and they should provide you test prints but uh that's uh, bay photo mpix i think i think there's a, a couple of recommendations um so pat asked again uh, matrix or spot metering um so when a camera what is the question is what is uh oh i'm sorry do you use is that what the question or what is sorry i missed that one let me go back to answered i think i can pull it up and answered pat says that's do you use? Do you use? I use, I, good, that's easy one. I use uh, spot metering um, most of the time. Because I, like I said, I, I, you know, if it's like, if you look at Duncan's picture, if it's the person with the yellow jacket uh, on the uh, forward mast, um, and that's what I'm focusing on and I'm zooming in on, I want them to be best exposed and best focused. Uh, so I generally use spot. Landscape, I, I, I'll use matrix. More right. questions. Anyone else? I think that's it, man. You did them all. By, by the way, awesome. No, really. I mean, I, I teach a lot. So awesome questions is, you know, very sophisticated audience with the questions that they're asking. It's obvious. So, but you can, you can always email me. You have my email. Uh, it's in the presentation. It'll be replayed. Email me. I'm, you know, I enjoy photography and I enjoy other people's photography as much as I enjoy taking photographs. So that's great. Well, Rich, on, on behalf of the American Schooner Association, the Great Chesapeake Bay Schooner Race, I want to thank you very, very much for the time you spent with me. I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to put up Rich's screen one more time. So as I say goodbye to you all, we can take a look at what he did and how to get a hold of him there. And uh, thank you all very much for joining us. We've had a pretty good turnout tonight, almost 50 people. And if you have a chance, look us up the American Schooner Association, or the Great Chesapeake Bay Schooner Race, both of which are happy, active, and rolling along despite COVID. Thanks very much, Richard. Have a Thank great you, Duncan. Day. It's Everyone. always great to, to, to be with you. You betcha. I appreciate all the time we all spent. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice night, and the best to you all. Fair winds. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.